Chak Mahar, Tsiaman Tsiaya, Toy Stanak, Queen Snas, Siswai Snyaman. I always like to start anything I'm talking about with acknowledging, you know, something very dear to me, which is my language, that I can be thankful for the, the youth and the elders in my community who have, you know, kept it alive and are now revitalizing it. And I see that uh, as a metaphor for a lot of what I, I do in my work, the activism I've been a part of. I think about, you know, um, the last 20, 25 years that I've, I've I feel that I've been consciously active, like in my teenagehood into, into my time period now, and I think about you know, those before me and those that are continuing in the struggle, and it's, it's amazing to see an evolution of consciousness growing at a, at a pace it needs to. Um, so my, uh, my take on a lot of what we're talking about today is getting back to the simplistic elements of living and being and I think that's the message I'm really personally gathering from the previous two speakers. I look at uh, you know my approach to activism, what it is, what uh, what I think is is going to save the planet <laughs> because you know I think in the 70s a lot of people made fun of people that were doing the things we're just witnessing on this last little media clip, the, the idea of free stores, the idea of you know, doing things, it, it, be, it was more of a, an, a view, a worldview that it was all non-Indigenous people involved in that, but when we really think about it, you know, when we get down to the basics, why do we see, even in this country today, the traditions that stay alive, the cultural practices in place? You know, I mean, I, I started my day yesterday in the midst of a ceremony that's very ancient, that is uh, a big part of what the Coast Salish people believe in. So it, in the short time I was able to attend this ceremony that went on for hours because, uh, and it's not even again what it would have been back in the day, it would have been a week of what I witnessed yesterday, which is a memorial for an elder who did a lot of good work in his time, but most importantly, you know, he was one of the first people that taught me my language and uh, to witness his family continuing to acknowledge you know, his spirit and his good work through his life, it tells me that we are holding on to everything we need to today to keep it alive. It's about bringing in all of our communities. Working with the Witness Program a number of years back, I, I saw a change happen that hadn't been happening in the world, where you had indigenous groups doing their activism, you had environmental groups doing their activism, activism. You had feminists doing their, their work. We're all doing this work. It all kind of exists out there, but it's not crossing over. The bubbles aren't crossing. And so the work that I was involved in with Witness came around to full circle with us showing that as all of these communities working together with the simplistic goal of peaceful activism, sustainability of what that activism is, uh, and acknowledging what our elders have told us all along that you know we you know yeah fight fiercely to hold on to the land to our rights but we also need to look at that what kept our our people alive for centuries it was ceremony it was food gathering it was living off the land it was respecting the land that we we walk on that we live in that we build our homes from and taking taking only what we need and you know being aware that if I need this, there's probably others coming past me that are going to be gathering from this. So the work I've been involved in over the last, I don't even know how many years, but, but I'll say in my community in the last five years I've witnessed um, the work that elders who have survived residential school, who have survived colonization, who have survived living in dysfunction for most of their lives, uh, for a greater part of their lives when they started out in a very simple way, started out gardening, uh, living off the land. Um, you know, it's a myth that Aboriginal people don't, uh, aren't agriculturalists, that, uh, that that was introduced to us and that we know in the Three Sisters gardening that a number of Indigenous people did on this uh, continent decades, centuries before contact with European culture. 
So agriculturalism is not a new word and terminology, and neither is the idea of, of what we now term decolonizing our soil. So hearing the, hearing the thoughts and themes of other communities is important to me because I see that the teachers in my path are doing this work out in the world. They are having to go out into communities and instruct people from the ground up, literally. And so when I say decolonizing our soil, like I've read articles about how people are saying, oh, organics aren't always the way because look, the soil isn't fed. And it's like, well, part of organic gardening has always been to feed the soil. That's first and foremost where you start. You know, the fish that we eat, putting it back into the earth. That's feeding the soil. Again, watching, watching the teachers around us, if humans are the children of all creation, why are we destroying all of the creation around us? Why are we not listening to the birds and the, and the animals? And why are we not following those teachers and their practices of sustainability, right? So, so even like when I walk in Stanley Park and I find shells thrown through the forest because I do go off the beaten path probably more than most people, but, um, but when I go there, I discover those treasures of uh, the shells in the forest from the birds eating those. So they alone are continuing that, that method of sustainability. Yet humans, what are we leaving in the forest? We're leaving garbage and crap and uh, needles, condoms, you name it. Like, there's a lot of things you can find just walking through an urban forest, and they're not always, not always good things. So, what are we as human beings if you know we are supposed to be, you know, the greatest creation of all? These teachings I'm sharing with you come from elders. That's what I've been taught that that we exist because we were supposed to be the final chapter, the part that brought all of creation together. Yet all we do is destroy it. We we ourselves, in this day and age, all of us are colonized. And we, every day, have to take a foot towards decolonization through simple, simple living and simple practices. Uh, starting these free stores is an amazing way of supporting the people in our community that, I mean, today we do that to help others. We don't do it to help ourselves. <laughs> You know, because we want to stay in debt and we want to, you know, get somewhere else. But we're, you know, we're finding our own selves divided in our belief systems and our practices. So everything we do does matter. Everything that it takes for us to to make that first step starts with, you know, showing up. I, when I showed up at the conference, I, I admitted that I did the one thing I normally used to always do. I didn't. I forgot to do that today. I forgot to bring my bowl. I forgot to bring my cup, and I was like, I'm not practicing my sustainability. I'm not like I'm allowing myself to stay in that colonized state of, I'll I'll get it when I get there. There's the disposable culture. So, each of us, we every one of us in this room is a part of another community, and. When we leave here, everything we've discussed this weekend, everything we've engaged in needs to continue. That's what sustainability is about, like not just talking our talk, but walking our walk. So I brought with me today in my, you know, in my way of uh, considering how are we like, how are we going to save the planet? How are we gonna practice sustainability? And I think of like, I think of corn, where it was and where it is today. So this corn that I'm holding in, your hand, in my hands right now is Zapatista corn that was uh, seeds that were given to me by a very good, good friend of mine, Erika Del Carmen Fuchs, and she carried these seeds up from the Zapatista people several years ago and has distributed them. Um, I successfully grew them from seed to, to seed, you know, which is super exciting. When we're looking at, in the last, uh, how many years, how many decades that we've been consumed by GMOs and uh, this move towards a seedless agriculture and uh, of it being owned by the Monsantos and the Bill Gates of the world. Like, why are we, you know, giving that much power over to a small percentage of humans on the planet that only seek to destroy and, and take away? So the basic system of, of sharing seeds in our cultures from wherever we come from is part of how we're going to save our planet. It's uh, growing our own food, listening to the elders. This, these, seed, these corn that I have in front of me were grown in a community garden started by elders in my community. The elders are worried 
they, they see that the future of sustainability is, is non-existent if our children aren't in the garden with them. And, uh, and their vision was to create, to, just to start off with a kitchen, a simple idea of let's create a kitchen because our people are eating alone. They are isolated, they are sitting next to each other in their homes, not even sharing meals. So it starts with that. Um, my greatest guides have always been the elders around me, and not always those from my communities, but those from many other communities. The reason I know the things I know in my life about traditional medicines and traditional foods is because I've, I've gone to the distance I need to personally to, to learn those teachings firsthand. Um, you know, not always taking the academic route, which kind of sucks when you're trying to get a job, but, <laughs> um, but you know, never ever uh, ceasing to value what it is that people that are oral traditionalists and sharing the, that knowledge, that is a higher level of education I'm gonna, than I'm gonna receive in any institute, anywhere, and, and that alone to me is a more sustainable, obviously sustainable uh, method of living because without our oral traditionalists, our language wouldn't even be alive today. And I don't just mean mine as a Squamish person, I mean, like anybody in this room, where you come from, we all have our own roots of where we started. And, you know, I've always tried to kind of project that back to people when they're asking, how do you, uh, how do you, you know, feel about non-native people learning your language? I'm like, I think people should always learn the language from where they're from. I, I don't disagree with people taking that, but I don't always see that as sustainable. And it's the same with our foods, you know. If we're just growing genetically modified sub substances, we're not really being true to who we are and where we're from. Looking at the plants we've lost over time and how there are still a few seeds or tubers left from, from plants such as camas and wapato and a number of indigenous species to, I'll, I'll only speak from my region, but to the Pacific Northwest Coast. Um, Again, I've spent a good 20 years on the land gathering foods, you know, whether people laugh at me or not when I'm in parks and I'm <laughs> gathering uh, hawthorn berries or rose hips, uh, whatever it may be, raspberry leaf, always being told by non-native people I shouldn't be eating the huckleberries because they're poisonous. And, you know what I mean? If I listened to everything I was told around me and didn't just follow my heart and mind, I would be a lot more lost and I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have the strength to, to do the work I do, which I see each and every one of us. Again, in this room, it's, we're all responsible to our own future as, as humans and, and as children of creation. So without looking at the elements of decolonizing our soil, going back to that, feeding our earth that we want to grow food in, we need to start literally from the ground up. We need to put, you know, we need to eat food that we can put in the ground and, de and, and that it decombusts, it breaks down, it's biological, it's not, uh, it's not killing the earth, it's not creating an unhealthy environment for the next living thing that comes along. So looking at waste practices, looking at, um, just looking at how we daily live, watching these little clips, it's like I love to see things like that, free markets. We don't see that. We see, we're next to Metro Town, a giant consuming entity that is just like mass. And it's like, it's, you know, it's filled with people like, uh, like Stephen was saying, like we're, we're looking at people going into the machine and no different than the movie Metropolis, we're going in, there's always a shift change, right? There's people going in there, they're working to make money to consume on their way out to, to go home and feed and clothe themselves with, you know, in the end they come back with probably virtually no money, but they have their clothing and their food and that's all they have. They still don't have an attachment to the earth because they're in a, a big cement box and they're just, you know, part of the, the ticking, time mechanism of, of what capitalism and commoditization is all about. So we are not really participating in a living entity. We're just contributing to something dead and we ourselves are feeding ourselves that dead energy. Being here today is, is probably more energizing to people than being in their job the rest of the week that we're all gonna be doing, right? So, um, 
So I don't know, it just gets back to this idea of like, how do we, how do we save the planet? How do we go forward? How do we take you know, care of, of that, what um, we're responsible for, and, and, and that's ourselves, our family, and our communities. We start from the ground up. We feed the soil. We feed the soil things that it needs, that it's not, that's not going to kill it. You know? Taking out your bike and uh, you know, the transit system isn't, it sucks in the city, I won't even lie. Um, I would rather be on a bike 12 months of the year if I could be. Um, as it is, we live in a city that forces us to work, force, forces us to live a certain way. It's really up to us as individuals how we, how we take that on. Obviously, there's enough conscious people in this room and in our communities that the things that exist that really matter are the community kitchens, are the community gardens, are the food security projects, uh, so on and so forth. Your best, uh, your best bet for sustainability is to always be involved in projects and community energies and efforts that are taking you and your community forward. Um, I don't know, I, I find things like this hard to just talk about just to a group of people, but I, but I really believe as a whole that, that you all wouldn't be here if you didn't actually have the motivation to make those changes in your community and if you weren't actually doing direct action, whether it be being part of a, a collective of some kind, whether it's a community collective of parents that share childcare so you don't have to work to buy, you know, to pay for, for childcare that you can't even afford that keeps your children away from you and away from your values. Um, the idea of people that educate, that do home so, uh, schooling circles, these are all old, not so much new, but it's taken us, I think it's taken society several years to grasp that where we started a hundred years ago or more is where we need to get back to. And that's really, that's really what I see about you know, how we're going to create a sustainable living, sustainable communities and a sustainable planet. Not through, you know, the direct action people take that and think, you know, terrorist or think like, oh, you're gonna blow buildings up. And that's not really what direct action is anymore. And I think it always was about keeping things real, about keeping things in the present, but honoring what our elders have taught us in order to give the future generations, which is our youth, that hope and that, uh, those tools of sustainability. So my, my views about this ecological plunder is that we need to keep things simple, we need to go back to our past, we need to listen to elders. You need to grow at least one thing that you're eating throughout the year, even if you live in a, an apartment, I don't care. Like I live in a, an apartment with no earth around me, but I grow my tea on my front porch. I grow kale outside of my, uh, my front door. These are things that, if I don't have some kind of food and medicine outside that I can walk out and pick, I'm feeling way too, too, way too detached from the world and I can't afford to live the way I'd like to live having a yard around me so I'm going to make what I have work in front of me whether it's growing that pot of, of mint tea, whether it's growing that pot of kale so I'm always putting something nutrition in my system and it's, you know, it's outside, it's not detached from the earth and it's not making me forget about where I am and where I'm, where I'm going and where I come from. And those are the things that I think we all need to carry with us. If you don't know where you are, or you don't know where you're from, then learn it. If you don't know where you are today, figure it out. And without understanding where you're from, you don't know where you're going in the future. So get back to the simplistic elements of, of researching even who you are, and, uh, and taking what you can from your elders. Take the seeds of resist resistance and grow them, because this little, this little cob of corn is going to feed a whole community. It's, a, it's something small I hold in my hand, but it will feed people and nourish them. And it will be something from the past that still exists. So that's it. Thank you.